For this next section, we're going to be talking about how do we help learners to talk about the texts that they have been exposed to. Um, as we think about this, we're going to be thinking about different levels of proficiency. The performance characteristics typical of each level of proficiency. How we might support the cognitive processes that learners need to use in order to interpret and exchange information. And how we support learners in exchanging that information. Um, as we think about this content, one of the things that I will sort of say is that you're not going to be satisfied at the end of this module. There's not time in 20 minutes or even two hours to give you all of the information that you might like about this piece. And that's one of the reasons that we have the Summer Institute. So rather than being frustrated by that, I would encourage you to think about, okay, how can I take this little chunk and start applying it in my classes right now, even if I'm not ready to do a project yet. And experiment with these ideas um, so that by the time you are ready to come to the Summer Institute, because of course I'm assuming that you all will, um, then you'll have an, a, a better sense of what your real questions are and um, what things work for you and what you need more information about. So what do we mean by proficiency? Proficiency, according to the actual performance descriptors, um, involves real world situations, the spontaneous interaction of, you know, or use of language in those situations, in unrehearsed contexts, and ways that are acceptable and appropriate to native speakers, which is the pragmatic piece that you've been working with uh, in previous modules. So, what is important for us about that is that we can use the characteristics of each proficiency level to help us identify what learners are going to need in or need help doing in order to move to perform tasks that are occurring at more advanced levels. So if we think about novices, they can use memorized practiced words and phrases, simple sentences and lists. They tend to only be able to handle things they've practiced, and they use a lot of memorized responses. If I think about intermediate language users, they can participate in simple conversations about a variety of different topics as long as they're familiar, using more sophisticated language, sentences and strings of sentences, which are sentences that appear in any order and it doesn't really change the meaning of what they're saying um, and they can answer and ask basic questions to meet their needs. The advanced level is like a storyteller. They can narrate a sequence of events, they can describe things, they can speak in the past, present, or future, they speak with more confidence and more ease, and they can handle unexpected complications. In other words, they're a little better at circumlocuting. Um, around things they don't know. And at the superior level, um, this is an area where learners can discuss social and political issues. They can explain complex matters. They can use a lot of detail. They can provide structured arguments and they can participate well. We're not gonna go into the distinguished level um, for our purposes today. So the main thing that I want you to walk away thinking about here is if I want learners to be able to do the things that are listed here at the superior level, I cannot wait until they have reached advanced classes to start teaching those skills. We should be asking students, in my personal opinion, to start talking about social and political issues to start giving explanations, to start making arguments and stating opinions when they're novice learners. Now, the caveat here is that the language they're going to, do, to use to do these things is going to be very simple and basic. So I can accomplish stating an opinion by saying, I think, or I believe, 
or I can state an opinion using the present subjunctive, right? Using more complex uh, grammatical structures or hypothesizing or things like that. So we need to select the appropriate structures and provide the sufficient scaffolding that learners can do these things. We're gonna skip a couple of these slides. Uh, so in order for learners to produce language successfully, we're going to have to help them understand that they are going to use really basic language to say sophisticated things. Just as though they were explaining something really complicated to a three-year-old. We're going to need to invite them to do critical thinking as they are to perform tasks that use critical thinking as they do this. And we need to help them connect to personal experiences. How do we do that? Well, remember our goal is to reduce cognitive load. So we want to give them clear routines and procedures. If we have procedures in place for forming groups, for how we work in pairs, for how we distribute materials, for how we give feedback, for how we track progress, that takes a lot of the uncertainty out of the communicative process so that learners then have the resources or the, the bandwidth and you know, the mental ability to just focus on put, stringing the language together. We can establish norms for how they're going to interact. We can give clear instructions. So you've seen lots of examples of this in my materials, but just to kind of remind you, only one thing that we want them to do for each line, five numbered lines, no more than seven to 10 words per step. So that might look something like this form a group of four, select a topic from the list, find information about your topic in Chinese, include three different sources of information, use the information to complete the group worksheet. So every step only contains one action. And if I have more than five steps, I've found it tends to mean that I'm either not being clear in my instructions or that I've actually got two separate activities here. So something as simple as this dramatically improves a learner's ability to complete a task, even when I'm giving them these instructions to adults in English, you know, in their native language, for example. Give them models and examples, just like Lego does. And then when we're thinking about scaffolding language, we need to be thinking about all the different types of language that need scaffolding. We need to provide support for them to talk about the topic. That might involve key grammatical structures or specific key words that they're going to need to talk about the environment or to talk about uh, freedom or whatever the topic of our project is. We need to scaffold language for the texts. Usually this has to do with academic language. This does not mean picking out every single technical word that they don't know and defining it for them. It means reading through the text and saying to yourself, what words are so critical that if you don't understand them, your entire understanding of the text breaks down. And targeting those words in, in terms of pre-teaching them before they read the text. It means providing language for the task. So, Maybe what I want them to do is sequence. What kinds of words are they gonna to need to, to use in order to sequence information? First, next, um, you know, ordinal numbers, things like that. If they're going to compare and contrast, what kinds of words do they need? So thinking about the language for the process and not just the content then what kind of language are they gonna need for the social talking that is part of the task? For the pragmatic elements, for example, how do they add a new point? Or how do they clarify? Or how do they interrupt? What kinds of responses could they give when other people are talking? You know, so when we talk to each other, we say things like, wow, that's a really good point. I had never thought of that. Oh, you're kidding me. I can't believe you said that. Those kinds of responses are called rejoinders. And one easy way to scaffold those is at the bottom of our worksheet where we're at, you know, our task worksheet where that gives students instructions, 
we might just put a little word bank with five rejoinders they're gonna play around with during the course of that conversation. Think about if you only gave them three rejoinders every time they had a paired task to do, how much language they would acquire over time just from doing the activity, not because you specifically or explicitly taught the structures. Um, and then we need to make sure that we're providing them with enough tools and scaffolding for the tools so that they can use the technology or you know, understand the instructions or whatever. So there's a planning sheet in your packet to help you think about, okay, for my pre-reading activity, if these are my two texts and this is the thinking task, they're gonna compare and contrast or they're going to categorize or they're going to sort, and th these are the talking tasks, then what oral language do I want to hear coming out of their mouths in the pre-reading activity? What language do I want them to use um, to talk about the content? What language do they need for the task? And what language do they need for group interaction? So this will help you to plan that information. In terms of a process for scaffolding interpersonal communication, you're gonna to need to ask yourself, what is the targeted communicative function? And then you're gonna to need to make a series of choices. And I've listed them as A, B, C, D, E. So if I know that this is my communicative function, what activity structure am I going to use to help learners practice it? Is that gonna be inside outside circles? Is it a debate? Is it that I'm going to have um, learners list pros and cons? What is it that I'm gonna have them do? Step two is how can I take that task and break it into smaller chunks? Step three is how do I need to scaffold the content? Step four is how can I scaffold the decisions students need to make? And step five is how can I scaffold students' expression or, or production of the language about this content? So here's an example. Let's say that I want that my communicative function here is that I want students to give opinions, okay? The activity structure, the A, is going to be inside outside circles. So this is how they're gonna form two circles and they're gonna talk to each other in their circles. The B is that I'm gonna break the content into chunks. So the first chunk is what is your opinion about whatever the topic is that we're discussing. The C is that I'm thinking about that communicative function, opinion, which means I'm gonna to need to give scaffolding or sentence starters to help them express that thing. So the D will say things like I'm in favor of or against whatever it is. I'm helping them to make a decision. The E is I feel this way because, and I'm prompting them give three reasons. Of course, this would all be in the target language. And then the last piece is that I'm gonna give them some strategies for expressing those reasons. Although some people say, blah, blah, I think such and such because so and so. So notice I've thought through the task here and I've tried to say, what's the first thing, if they're gonna express an opinion, what's the first thing they're gonna to have to know? They're gonna to have to know what they're expressing an opinion about. What's the second thing they have to do, the second decision they have to make? They have to decide if they're for or against that topic. What's the third thing they have to do? They have to be able to state the opinion and then provide reasons to back it up. And then what's the last thing? Well, I need to give them the language to do it. So really just envisioning someone completing your task and then breaking it down into steps will work wonders for your learner's ability to produce. Uh, here's another example. So in this case, um, I'm thinking about scaffolding the grammar, right? So they're going to look at a piece of culturally authentic realia, for example, the money. The money tells them where they're going. They're going to the bank. So I want them to draw a little picture in that box of where they're going. Then they have to decide banco. Does that word end with an A or with an O? And so they are putting the answer in that blank. And then over here on the right, and I missed a little step here, 
Um, on the right, I would have A and O so that they know where to go next. If it ends with an A, then they're going to say voy a la and the name of the place. If it ends with an O, they're going to say a, voy al. So they're choosing which structure they need. Something like this scaffolds the decision making that they have to do in order to generate the correct answer in terms of the grammar. Uh, I can scaffold their decision making about the tasks. So if I'm having them create a board game, like you saw in one of the, um, uh, the Casa Italiana project, um, then I need to think about what do they need to think about in terms of their prior knowledge to be able to do this successfully and how could I structure that? So I might do something like, what kinds of games do you like to play? And they're gonna check off all that apply. This again would be in the target language. I put it in English so you can follow it. What are some of your favorite games? So now I'm getting them to activate their prior experience with games. What about the games that you listed makes them fun to play? They're listing characteristics. So what am I doing with this first page? I'm getting them to analyze their own personal experience so they can use it as a resource for creating the language and the product that they're going to create. Then I might use these questions to help them invent their own games. Think about games they've played. What kind of theme was it organized around? How was it structured? Did you have to just answer a question or generate as many answers as possible or get it around the game board first? Um, now make some decisions about which of these things you've just brainstormed is your game going to include? And what kinds of pieces do you need to do your game? So that by the time they've completed this worksheet, they know they've thought through all the pieces they need to think about so that then they can make decisions and move forward quickly in actually generating, you know, they can spend most of their time thinking about the language they need for their game rather than thinking about all of the other things that they have to do because I've structured that for them. Here's another great example that I'm using with permission from Chad Manis of a worksheet for scaffolding think, pair, share. So first, um, students have a particular topic and they're writing or question and they write down in the left hand box what they thought. Then they share that with their partner and they write down what their partner thought. Then the two of them together in the third box decide what they're going to share with the whole group. And then as they listen to all of the groups share, they are making a list of key information that was the most important from all of that sharing. Then they figure out what they think and then they talk to their partner about it. So this is a way of structuring different types of interaction so that learners always have something specific to do but what we're really doing here is structuring their thinking. Here's an example of how we might structure their thinking with manipulatives. So maybe I want them to build a sentence, right? So they're going to pick the person on the left-hand side, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, is going to which place, right? And so, they are moving these things around so that they make sentences. Here's a more concrete example. So Joan of Arc is going to the grocery store um, in the uh, tower or whatever, you know, the place that I want her in, in this in Rouen, for example. Um, the man is going to talk to the woman um, by the river or whatever I want them to say. So I can set it up so that they connect the dots and the pictures help them to produce the language to remember what they want to say. And then they compare that with the partners to see if the lines on their paper match. Um, I can scaffold survey, survey tasks by giving them sentence frames and question frames. So the top of this worksheet shows the question, do you like such and such? Then I've provided a word bank for words that they're gonna choose to stick into that question frame. 
And then you'll notice that I've sequenced that. So now they have specific sentence frames and they can tell from the table who's going to speak first. So partner A is going to say, and forgive my terrible pronunciation, Nishi Juan uh, Judo Ma, right? And partner B is going to listen. And then partner B is going, partner A is going to listen while partner B says, so you're saying, do you like, you know, beef or do you like chicken or do you like whatever? And the partner's saying, I like whatever it is, or I don't like. So I've given them two options to choose from in order to produce the language. Then I've given them a structure for sharing that information. So after I listen, then my job is to write my partner's name, to check off whether they liked or didn't like it, and to write the name of the food. Now this is a really simplistic example, but you can take the exact same structure and apply it to the more sophisticated questions you might want your students to practice in preparation for an interview for their project, for example. I can structure how I have learners obtain feedback. So maybe my learner is gonna list an idea that they want to share or an opinion in the upper left-hand corner. Then they are going to go around and talk to each of the people in the class. And the person in the class is going to listen to the idea and then indicate how they feel about the idea. Do they agree or do they disagree or are they confused? And they indicate that by bubbling in the appropriate place on the um, worksheet. Then they're going to say why. They're going to give one reason why they agree or one reason why they disagree with your project idea, for example, or your product idea. And the learner is going to take notes about strengths and concerns mentioned by their peers. And then their peers that they've talked to are going to sign over on the right. So the learner is filling out everything on the left based on what their partner says. And then their partner is um, signing off that that was correct. Think about how this helps structure the talking, how this helps structure the thinking as they are learning to provide opinions. And then the rejoinders we already talked about. And so there are lots and lots of great lists that um, various people like Amy Leonard have put together for their students to help them figure out what they want to say and to practice that. Uh, this would be an example of scaffolding language for a sequencing task. So I know that if they're talking about these culturally infused stories, um, the first one talks about an elf um, and some flying spaghetti, as silly as that sounds. The second one is talking about a boy who ends up having squash plants grow out of his ears. And so I go through the stories and say, okay, what are the seven key words that my learners absolutely have to understand and be able to use in order to talk about what they read in this story? And I've identified those for each story. Then what kinds of vocabulary do they need in order to be able to sequence the pictures in the story so that they can talk about what they think goes first or second before they've read the story? And so I've listed the different types of task vocabulary I might choose. At the lowest level, it might just be a learner holding up two pictures and their partner saying, yes, I like the order or no, I don't. As we get more sophisticated, then the learners can start to make sentences about first this happened, next that happened, then the following thing happened. So I can choose what vocabulary they're using. Um, but the idea here is that you can use these kinds of graphic organizers to sequence, to summarize, to analyze um, different types of tasks. So I'm going to let you kind of look through these on your own um, as you go back through the modules.